Hello everyone and welcome to Daily News Simplified, your one-stop solution for detailed analysis of current affairs which are published in the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper. I am Jatin Bhardwaj and I am going to take today's article which were published in the Hindu newspaper. The articles for today's discussion are displayed on your screen and the time stamping along with the notes in PDF and Word format are given in the description box. So let us begin with the first article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 1st and talks about a recent move taken by the Ministry of Commerce with respect to the ruling out of new trade policy or you can say new export and import policy for India. Now the previous policy has already been functioning over and above its mandate that is the previous policy was for the period of 2015 to 20. However, because of the COVID crisis, government could not bring a new exim policy. Hence, the previous policy was extended till 2022. Now, government has rolled out a new policy, which was actually unveiled by the Ministry of Commerce. Please make sure that trade policy is not part of Ministry of Finance. It is part of Ministry of Commerce under the Department of Commerce. The relevance of this topic is wide. From the perspective of General Studies Paper 3, Indian economy and the issues relating to the planning because policy making is a part of planning. The second is with respect to the growth, development and employment because trade is an engine to growth. And the third is effects of liberalization on the economy because opening up of the external sector is nothing but a form of liberalization. Hence, in one way or the other, UPSC can ask this question from the perspective of these three topics in your general studies paper 3. Now, we'll go through the entire discussion where we are going to look into what is a foreign trade policy. So, we'll start from the scratch. We will go through the basics first. Then we'll look into why foreign trade policy is being created. What are the basic objectives? We are going to look into the history of basic foreign trade policy since independence then we will look into the discussion of the previous trade policy that is the policy of 2015-20 after that we are going to look into the policy which was announced yesterday by the government so first we'll cover up the basics then we will move towards the current policy then we will look into why do actually we need such kind of policies then we will move towards the current status of the external sector the issues which are being faced by what is the current geopolitics, what is the current geoeconomic situation which is being covered. This section would be taken up from the economic survey of 23 which was published this year on 1st of February. Then we will lastly move towards the possible way forward for the further extension and the improvement of external sector in India. After the entire discussion, we are going to discuss this practice question which says new foreign trade policy 2023 has brought new avenues for export promotion. So this is what we are going to discuss about the new avenues which were brought by this policy. Analyze the policy. So we are going to analyze the policy in the discussion and state how challenges faced by the external sector. We are also going to look into all the challenges major one of the Indian economy could be resolved. So we'll see that how this policy is going to resolve the issues faced by the external sector. So without any delay, let's begin the discussion with understanding what is a foreign trade policy. Now foreign trade policy is a set of rules and the procedure. So please understand these are the rules which will guide the conduct of the external trade of a country. It determines what should be the basic procedure for conducting the trade. It will facilitate the imports into a country augment the exports from India and also create favorable balance of payment situation. Now you must be well aware that as far as balance of trade is concerned, so India has more imports than the exports. And that is the reason why we have balance of trade to be in deficit. This deficit sometimes becomes so large that it becomes a problem for the government of India to balance the overall payment which includes not only the balance of trade but also the balance on services and other accounts. All the foreign trade policies that have been created till now are part of the Department of Commerce which looks into the formulation and the monitoring. But when it comes to the implementation, it is the Director General of Foreign Trade which implements the foreign trade policy. So the current policy which was highlighted yesterday will also be implemented by DGFT. 
all the powers to create foreign policy by the government comes from the Foreign Trade Development and Regulation Act 1992. The moment we say 1992, one thing should come to your mind, one thing should strike to your mind that this is the phase which we called as the LPG beginning. This is the phase where India shifted towards the liberalization, privatization and the globalization. And that is one of the reasons why government required a particular act which empowers the Ministry of Commerce to create a particular policy for the promotion of the trade. Now, because of this basics, government has created multiple policies. But every policy down the line has some basic objectives. Now, what are those objectives which determines the foreign trade policy? These are the basic objectives of India's foreign trade policy. The first is that all the policies have one way or the other targeted increase in exports and reduction in the imports. Why? To balance the trade. The second is trade is always seen as an engine to growth or engine for economic growth. Hence, whatever money that we earn from the export does not comes with a price. Let's take an example. If we want money and we are taking loans from let's say IMF or World Bank, we are going to pay back these loans through the interest. If we are going for the external commercial borrowings, if a company of India is borrowing from a company from US, they have to pay hefty interest. Or they might have to share the equities in their company under foreign direct investment. But when it comes to the export, it is a pure earning. We do not have to pay money or have to share any kind of equities with the foreign entity. Hence, it is going to boost the economy. Then comes this 2x share in the global merchandise. India has always been looking into double its global merchandise share. 2x does not mean the overall percentage, it means 2x every time. So if it is 2% this time, we are going to target 4% next time and 8% after that. Government is also looking to improve the balance of payment and the trade that we have already discussed. Another objective is to create opportunities because the export sector has a great potential for the employment generation. It also brings the sustainable growth for the production sector because things which are not consumed in the country can easily be exported to those countries or nations where the demand is high. For example, if we talk about the IT services which are not being consumed in India can easily be exported to the foreign sector, especially the western countries. Then comes the technological capacity. If we talk about the exports from India, you'll find that automobile sector or the IT sector and even now the mobile phones are taking the lead. This shows the technological capacity that India is now registering across the globe. It is cost effectiveness because promotion to export not only helps in the production employment generation but it also brings the external earnings. It increases the competitive strength of a nation and People who are exporting goods, the firms which are exporting goods, try to move towards the international standards. That is the reason why we have common parlance of saying export quality. It drives maximum benefits. Even export helps in the ease of doing business and e-governance. There's a hassle-free transactions. So every policy, even you talk about the 2015 policy or even today, the policy that we are going to discuss about talks about the hassle-free transaction. It is ease of doing business. Then there is a reduction in the number of export documents. These are also the objective. Then allowing the import of technology and the equipments for the better production. We are looking for the industrial revolution 4.0. And can this be possible without a good trade policy? Then we are looking into establishing advanced licensing systems, Director General of Foreign Trade and its role is also important for the objective. We are looking for the duty-free imports of inputs, open general licensing systems, license issued by the government. So one way or the other, there are multiple objectives which requires the bringing up of a new export policy after a short while. Now, if we move towards the basic evolution of the foreign trade policy, we'll find that India's foreign trade policy was not the open door always. In the first five-year plan, in the second five-year plan, 
India's foreign trade policy had different dimensions. When we started the planning process, we started focusing on the reconstruction and development on the agriculture sector. So right now we are focusing on the IT, but back then we were focusing on the agriculture goods. There was lack of industrialization and the competitiveness. So what we were doing, we were looking towards the restrictive trade policy or the inward looking trade policy. So ILS, it's a very important key term. Inward looking strategy means that we are focusing on restricting the imports from outside because we have to pay for it. Exports are not very high. So import increased manifold due to the rising imports of the capital goods and the agricultural commodities exports were very, very insignificant. Foreign action crisis emerged in India and India had to devaluate. When we move to the second plan, we'll find that there was a massive program of industrialization thanks to the Mahela Nomis model under which industrialization of the capital goods and heavy machinery was emphasized. Crop failure led to the huge imports and here also we had the high trade deficit. Here India started looking for the import substitution. That if we cannot restrict the imports, let's start producing the goods in India itself. However, there was a small push given to the export promotion as well. There was a push given to the imports of capital goods and the agriculture commodities. However, not all the goods were imported and there was a slight rise in the exports as well. When we move towards the other plans and the other consecutive foreign trade policies, we'll find that rapid industrialization defense needs were increased in the following years because of the wars with China and Pakistan. There was again the high emphasis given on the import substitution. However, export promotion now continued. Imports again increased, export remains less, there was a persistence, adverse balance of payment. Moving ahead, we found that there was an acute shortage of the foreign exchange with India. IMF had to go for the rescue. Green revolution already led to the higher production of the crops, hence the agriculture imports were falling. But there was a problem of high oil prices. India have to devalue its currency again to reduce the imports. You'll find that in all the four periods, India was focusing entirely on the imports, whether it's the import substitution, imports of the defense goods, capital goods, or even the devaluation. The entire focus was the imports itself. And that continued in the next decade also, but with a gradual decline. In 1970s and 1980s, we'll find that there was a gradual increase in the overall liberalization. We started exporting the agriculture goods. The moment we say exporting means now we were producing some surplus. Higher oil prices led to the domestic production, which is a good sign. So we here also started import substitution. But there was a fall in the exports as well. BOP worsened. And when BOP worsened, India moved towards the export promotion and the import liberalization. This was followed and continued even in the second half of the 1980s, where export promotion and liberal import liberalization was adopted. Now, all these instances that we have discussed are taken from the research of planning commission between the period of 1950 to 1990. After the 1991, we all know that we shifted towards the liberalization where India's economy was opened, thrown open to the world economy. Tariffs were reduced. Export duties were reduced. India moved gradually towards the liberalization. Easy credit was made available. So and so forth, India's foreign trade policy moved towards the export promotion rather than the import substitution. Now, one important thing that should be discussed is the foreign trade policy between 2015 to 20, that is the previous policy. Now, we are discussing this policy because UPSC might ask the comparison between the previous policy and the current policy. Hence, we should have some basic idea with respect to this policy. The basic goal of this policy was to increase the exports. Now here we are not at all talking about the import. There is nowhere in the policy will find emphasis given to the import. And that is one of the reason why we have discussed the evolution of India's export policy. From import substitution, now we are moving towards the export promotion in the wholesome manner. Under this policy, to increase the overall export of merchandise, that is goods and services, to $900 billion by the year 2020. However, this target could not be achieved and we have still not crossed $800 billion even in the 2023. 
and this wanted India's share in the world export to increase to 3.5% which has not been achieved by now. The objective of the policy says that India was looking for stable, sustainable policy environment. So there was no sudden changes in the policy parameter. Export promotion mission for India, which is an obvious sign after the liberalization of 1991. India was looking for the diversification of India's export basket, that is goods and services, but not the market. This is one of the limitation of this policy. Why not markets? Why cannot we bring more destinations rather than more goods in the basket? It calls for the achievement of the global competitiveness because somewhere down the line, India is not at all competitive in most of the goods it is exporting with respect to China, Taiwan and South Asian countries. Better integrating with major regions, especially the US and Europe. Boost Make in India initiative because 2015 is the year when Make in India was already in fashion. To rationalize the imports and to reduce the trade imbalance. As far as features are concerned, so these are the five features which you should know. Beyond this, no detailed analysis is required. So the first one is the merchandise export from India scheme, which is the incentive based scheme for the exports of goods. Second is served from India schemes, which replace the services export from India scheme. This has provided more extension incentive to those firms which are exporting services. Then comes the status holder. So 2 star, 3 star, 4 star is the status given to a particular manufacturer who can self-satisfy their manufactured good. This has reduced what we call as Inspector Raj. So unwanted interference from the government just to verify or certify a particular manufacturing good used to be a hurdle in the export of a particular good. So this was removed in the previous policy. Online filing of the documents application has provided ease of doing business. And lastly, over 108 micro, small and medium enterprises were identified for the export promotion. So this is also a good sign. But why do we have to come up with a new policy? The answer is that this policy ended in 2020 and from 2015 till now, the dimension has changed drastically. Now there is something which we called as e-commerce, which is now ruling the export sector. Then we are going through the IT enabled services, which is now ruling that we have application based services, for example, Zomato. So what if Zomato wants to export its services? What if Swiggy want to export its food item to Nepal or even Bangladesh? Are these items covered in these foreign policy? What government is doing for the promotion of these kind of services is still to be answered. Hence, government required the replacement of this previous policy with the new one. So now we are going to discuss about the foreign trade policy of 2023. The first important thing or part of the policy is its target. The policy talks about tripling the target for the exports. Currently, the export has registered $750 billion of total merchandise and service sector. The target from the policy is 2 trillion of exports by the year 2030. Next comes the district as export hub program. Under this, central government along with the partnership with the states is going to set up district as export hub now this is going to help in one district one product program under this district level export promotion will be created for this government will be creating two different bodies first one will be state export promotion committee and the second one would be district export promotion committee. So first one will be at the state level. The second one would be at the district level for the promotion of district as an export hub. Third one is open ended policy. Now, this is not a provision in the policy. It is just government of India's view on the export policy. Now, open ended policy here means that there is no end date. As you can see, we have written just 2023. But we have not written till when this policy is going to continue. The previous policy was between 2015 to 2020. But this is an open-ended policy. Government has said that they are going to revive, amend 
review this policy from time to time rather than bringing a new policy altogether they might amend this policy in the future as well so from that view it is a open ended policy the third important provision is facilitating the e-commerce export now according to the world bank e-commerce export potential of india is going to be around 300 billion dollar by the year 2030 now if industry is going to grow to such a height we need to facilitate their exports as well and that is one of the reason their payment reconciliation bookkeeping written policy and even their export entitlements would be covered under this policy then comes the towns of export excellence as of now government under this policy has announced four cities which is faridabad mirzapur muradabad and varanasi these four cities are going to be part of towns of export excellence which means that they are going to be the additional towns to the already existing 39 towns now what are these cities these cities are going to get access to the export promotion funds now if we talk about these cities these cities will be taken up as the priority cities which are going to be receiving more funds than the other cities which are not under this program for the export promotion so for example if i say there's a city a while there's a city b now city b is part of town export excellence program now city b is going to get 100 crores while city a might get let's say 10 crore for the export promotion then comes the one time amnesty program or one time amnesty scheme this is part of vivad se vishwas initiative under this government is going to sort for the settlement of the tax disputes for exporters who have been unable to meet their obligations under the export promotion credit guarantee scheme or advance authorization now export promotion credit guarantee scheme this schemes allow an exporter to import of capital goods including spare parts for the pre production production or even the post production stage at zero custom duty so i repeat at zero custom duty so let's say there's a car manufacturer who wants to import silencer or tires for the car and if they are exporting that car they are going to get zero custom duty benefit under the epcg program so all those people who are going through the tax disputes or any kind of legal hurdles for their obligation under the epcg is now or are now going to get one time settlement then comes the facilitation under the epcg program for this government is going to allow imports of the capital goods at zero custom duty for the export promotion even to the textile sector now we have already covered this program under the pm mitra and detailed discussion was conducted on 18th march this year you can watch the dns dated 18 march for more of this scheme this foreign trade policy is also going to look into the focus on scomet now what is scomet scomet is an abbreviation it's an acronym which stands for special chemicals organisms material equipments and technologies i repeat special chemicals organisms material equipment and technologies so government through this foreign trade policy is going to look into more agreements more treaties with other nations where these items could be traded easily then comes the capacity building by the status holder as we have discussed in the previous policy also some of the manufacturers were given the status holder for better performance in their exports and outputs now these status holder manufacturer will provided a facility where they can actually provide skill training for the apprentices they can hire apprentices they can teach them they can provide skill capacity building to these apprentices new people coming into the sector now the best benefit that india can have from this capacity building is there will be more export based on the expertise there is will be more export based on the skilled labor which will ha- definitely help india in the competitiveness in the international market and the last important thing is merchanting trade is now allowed in certain restricted goods now what is merchanting trade merchanting trade is the one where a good goes from one foreign country to the another foreign country 
without even touching the source country. Now, please understand this concept. This is important. Could be asked in the prelims as well. Let's say there is India, which is the owner of a particular good. Let's say Maruti cars. Now, these Maruti cars were manufactured in Sri Lanka and they are being exported to Iran. Now, company belongs to India and it is producing car in Sri Lanka which is being exported in Iran and this car has never touched the Indian boundaries. This is called as merchandising trade. Now, government of India has allowed Indian companies to trade or have merchandising trade in certain restricted and prohibited items which were not allowed previously. This will only be allowed through the RBI's compliance and the guidelines. India's gift city is going to have a better hand with respect to the merchandising trade in the services, especially the financial services. So these were the important pointers from this foreign trade policy that government has recently launched. Now the question arises that do India need such kind of policy at all? The answer would be yes. And these are the following reasons why we need such kind of new policy. The first reason is that the policy of 2015 is old and has been for extension for two years now. So it requires replacement. There are new sectors that are making their mark. E-commerce, IT and IT enabled services, mobile applications that we have discussed already. They require protection and export promotion as well. India's export growth has not been very promising. They have already missed the previous target of $900 billion. India's trade deficit is also widening with one or the other small instances, maybe a month or a quarter. India's overall trade has remained in deficit with higher imports and lower exports. Even in terms of the diversification, India is very poor. We are not exporting to most of the countries across the globe. Our free trade agreement is also being poorly performing. We have signed over 10 free trade agreements with the nations, but still their results are not very promising. New policies, new schemes are not in line with the old policy. For example, the Desh Act or One District, One Program, they are not in line with the policy of 2015. So in order to accommodate these new initiatives, we require new policy. Previous policy has already missed on the skill development as an important segment for the external development. And lastly, India need to take the advantage of transition goods and even the network products. These are those goods which are being produced at one place, exported to the other place. They are certain goods which are produced in different parts in different places and later on they are being assembled together for the exports. For example, let's talk about the Apple iPhone. So there might be some area where the body is being created, there might be some other areas where software is created and might be third place where the hardware is created. And these three products and inputs are then assembled at a fourth position and they are exported somewhere else. So these are the goods that India can take the advantage of. Hence, for the promotion of such kind of products, we require new policy. As per the ongoing global issues on trade, so global commodity prices are now increasing. That is, it is providing benefits to the producer, which also shows that the exporters are now getting benefit than what they were in a situation two years back. There is a tightening of the international financial condition, which is not a good sign. Fed Reserve of US it has already increased their policy rates. Bank of England has done the same. This has led to the appreciation of foreign currencies. Because of the appreciation of foreign currency, the foreign portfolio coming to India is now going back. There is an outflow of foreign portfolio investment. Because of that, there is a low capital account surplus. India is a country which has a very high capital account surplus. But because of the outflow of foreign portfolio investment, the overall surplus has now reduced down, although still not closer to the negative terms. Because of the low capital account surplus, there is a depletion of the foreign exchange reserves. Reserve Bank of India has to shed more foreign exchange in order to make payments 
to the outflow of the foreign portfolio investment so the capital account is low in terms of the financial volatility there is heightening of the financial market volatility across the world even the stock markets in india are under the stress there is a reversal of the capital flows as we have seen because of the appreciation of the foreign currency most of the currencies are depreciating as the major currencies like dollar is appreciating there is a looming global growth because of the overall lower demand in the global economy and overall all these factors have led to the slowing down of the global trade now because of these factors there is a low international demand of indian goods this has led to the low exports on the other hand higher domestic recovery after the pandemic has resulted into the higher imports especially in the sectors such as petroleum oil as well as the gold lower exports combined with the higher import has led to the higher current account deficit that india is facing although compared to many previous years it is bearable as far as economic survey on india's position is concerned so india is now the seventh largest service exporter in the world and overall contribute 4% of service exports almost 28% of growth in the exports came in the last financial year as far as softwares or the it services are concerned so before covid 19 the overall service export contributed mostly from the software exports but after the covid 19 non software service export has increased mostly because of the sectors like tourism and medical now what measures government has taken according to the economic survey in order to provide impetus to the export growth and control current account deficit the first one is to provide pm gati shakti mission to improve the overall infrastructure government has also rolled down the national logistic policy to reduce down the cost of logistic in the country government has signed new free trade agreement with the countries like uae and australia in terms of easing out the impact of foreign currency government is now looking for more avenues to trade in its domestic currency that is indian rupee government is now trading with indian rupee with countries like russia and sri lanka they have also provided extension to the foreign trade policy of 2015-20 for next 2 years they have also now focusing more towards the agricultural exports especially those from the farmers producer organizations and lastly government is now creating small export hubs such as one district one product initiative and all these measures were taken in order to provide basic support to the falling exports in india if we try to analyze the export and the external sector through data we can easily see that as far as capital account is concerned so net foreign direct investment is higher in the country net here simply means the difference between the outflow and the inflow of the fdi as far as india's growing and diversifying of merchandise trade is concerned so india is now diversifying more towards those countries which were not very much gaining the attention of india so the overall merchandise export for the period of april to december was around 332 which was higher than 305 previously new diversification markets for india includes the brazil south africa both of them are part of brics countries and saudi arabia which is also member to india in g20 india has signed around 13 free trade agreements and six preferential trade agreement with that of the uae and australia recently been concluded in terms of the overall remittances because remittances is one of the major contribution of current account in india's balance of payment so india is now emerging as the largest shareholder in terms of the overall remittances it has received so according to the report published in the economic survey india has received close to 100 billion dollar of the remittances as per the world bank in the year 2022 but when it comes to the overall debt structure india's overall short term debt contribute around 19% to its total debt in terms of how foreign exchange reserve india has so the india's foreign exchange to the debt is around 97% so understand this through this example let's say india has a overall debt of 100 rupee it simply proves that india right now is having 97 rupee as its foreign exchange 
विच इट कैन यूटिलाइज टू पे बैक इट्स ओवरऑल डेट सो नाइन्टी परसेंट इज द शेयर इन इंडिया बट वैन यू कंपेयर इट विद डेट ऑफ चाइना इट हैज हंड्रेड एंड ट्वेंटी थ्री परसेंट दैट इज द फॉरन एक्सचेंज रिजर्व ऑफ चाइना इज मोर देन द डेट इट हैज बट वैन यू कंपेयर टू द शॉर्ट टर्म डेट चाइना इज पुअरली परफॉर्मिंग इन कंपेरिजन टू द इंडिया इट्स शॉर्ट टर्म डेट इज फार फार मोर बट द टोटल एक्सटर्नल डेट ऑफ इंडिया इज मोर देन दैट ऑफ चाइना बिकॉज ऑफ इट्स पुअर परफॉर्मेंस इन द डोमेस्टिक फाइनेंशियल मार्केट now in the last from the external sector these are the important data that you should remember for the prelims as well as for the mains examination as far as merchandise export is concerned so india is around 1.8% to the total exports in the world on service it is 4% in terms of the import india is far more than what it has exported so india export 1.8% of the total but import 2.5% As far as India's rank is concerned, so on the 2020 data, India's merchandise exports is 21, but on import it is higher. This shows that India's current account deficit situation is not good. In terms of services, India is a good and a promising member in the world, but only for the export and not for the import. Now, even after numerous policy in the past, there are certain way forwards that we can't miss on. First, product and market. concentration should be increased let's start focusing more markets let's start targeting latin america central asia and africa india can leverage its products over there we need to go for integrated development of the infrastructure not only connecting the coastal areas with the hinterland but also connecting the districts with each other connecting small villages which have expertise on producing goods at a mass scale we have to go for replacing the inverted duty structure inverted duty structure or ids is the one where there is higher duties imposed on the inputs rather than the finished product this goes against the trade promotion we have to go for the door to door awareness for the export promotion there are small merchants across india who are producing at a small scale why not provide them avenues for the export promotion why not bring them in the inclusive manner for the promotion of exports export collection and distribution hubs should be created in potential districts where the people from the rural india could come they can collect their produce and these produce can then be distributed for the exports we have to move towards the new focus area for example handicrafts is the one which india can leverage small electronic items are the another one where india can leverage its potential for the exports and the last one is india need to focus more emphasis on the network products that we have already discussed about this is one area which will also help india for its initiatives under make in india program now with this entire discussion of the policy and its requirement we are now in a position to answer this question you can practice this question try to answer it within 250 words including the introduction and the conclusion that's all for this article let's now move towards the next one this article of the hindu newspaper appeared on page 10 and talks about australia's offer to diversify its lithium export that might include india as well now australia is looking to diversify its export of lithium Now Australia is one of the largest exporter as far as lithium is concerned. But as of now the largest importer for Australia's lithium export is US. Now once it says that they are looking for export diversification it simply means that India is going to be on the radar and India is going to have more benefits of its import diversification with respect to lithium. According to the recent act that is Inflation Reduction Act of US at least 40% of the critical minerals which includes lithium should be borrowed from those countries should be taken from those countries where US is sharing free trade agreement just to reduce the inflation now 40% of US market is being met by Australia but Australia wants to diversify so that it can go for shock absorption what if tomorrow us deny taking these lithiums from australia what australia will do 
दैट इज वन ऑफ द रीजन वाई एक्सपोर्ट डाइवर्सिफिकेशन इज रिक्वायर्ड इन मेजर एक्सपोर्ट आइटम्स नाउ ड्यू टू दिस क्लॉज यू एस इज द लार्जेस्ट यूजर ऑफ ऑस्ट्रेलियाज लिथियम ऑन द अदर हैंड इंडिया हैज टू रिलाय ऑन इट्स आर्च राइबल चाइना फॉर इट्स लिथियम इम्पोर्ट्स नाउ टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू लुक इन टू द बेसिक डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन ऑफ लिथियम अक्रॉस द ग्लोब द बेसिक प्रोडक्शन ट्रेंड एंड वॉट इज द करेंट स्टेटस ऑफ इंडिया विद रेस्पेक्ट टू द लिथियम इम्पोर्ट्स नाउ फ्रॉम द डायग्राम यू कैन इजिली सी ऑस्ट्रेलिया इज द लार्जेस्ट प्रोड्यूसर ऑफ द लिथियम हैज ऑल्सो बिकम्स द लार्जेस्ट एक्सपोर्टर चिली इज द सेकेंड वन विच इज पार्ट ऑफ द लिथियम ट्राइंगल इन साउथ अमेरिका फॉलोड बाई चाइना ऑस्ट्रेलिया प्रोड्यूसेज अराउंड फिफ्टी टू परसेंट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड प्रोडक्शन ऑफ द लिथियम बट दिस प्रोडक्शन इज कमिंग फ्रॉम द हार्ड रॉक माइंस ऑन द अदर हैंड इन चिली इट इज फ्रॉम द ब्राइन If we go through the basic distribution of the lithium in the last 25 year we will find that we all started in the year 1995 where the production was overall very low but if we look today we will find that Australia is the major player in the entire lithium production and that is one of the reason Australia is looking for the diversification in order to prevent itself from the external shock As far as lithium consumption is concerned so the 74% of the lithium consumption goes to the manufacturing of the batteries 14% goes to the ceramic and the glass and the rest 12% goes to the other items Now looking into the India status recently there was a article with respect to the discovery of the lithium reserves in India in Jammu and Kashmir which was also covered in the DNS so GSI that is geological survey of India has discovered around 5.9 million tons of the inferred resources of lithium in the Salal Haimana area of Jammu and Kashmir now inferred resources means which are at the preliminary stage where estimates are at the low confidence low confidence means that we are not 100% sure that it is going to be 5.9 million tons or not that is the reason why they are known as inferred resources now the moment we say india is going to have 5.9 million tons which makes india the second largest in terms of the lithium deposits in the world after chile australia remains at the third position despite being at the third position australia is the largest producer because it has utilized its policies for the mining of lithium the relevance of the new findings in india clearly proves that it is going to promote the green economy that is electric mobility we are expecting that the lithium demand is going to rise by 500% by the 2050 and india can easily leverage its reserves for that production it will reduce india's dependence on the imports hence a trade deficit can reduce down especially with respect to china india is going to produce and promote indigenization of the equipment especially the batteries and lastly it will reduce the overall trade deficit for india so the lithium discovery is going to be a win win situation for india until and unless the following issues are resolved india as of now has trade conflict with china so even if india starts the mining of this reserve india is not going to meet all its demand within a year on the other hand india is going through the trade conflict with china amid the border issues what if china stops its lithium exports to india india has never been able to utilize its existing resources of the discoveries including the petroleum and even the thorium the e waste is a major issue in india more lithium means more batteries and more batteries means more disposable batteries in india most of the mines are now being handed over to the private sector but if we look into the case of chile or the other countries there you will find that most of the mines producing lithium is under the state government control if it goes in the hands of private sector it might pose an issue so india have to resolve all these important issues before going wider into its aspect of producing lithium but as of now it is a good sign that india might leverage the open doors provided by australia with respect to the lithium exports that's all for this discussion let us now move to the next article for the day this article of the hindu newspaper appeared on page 11 and talks about the agreement of the uk to join the trans pacific partnership uk or the united kingdom after 21 month long talk has acceded to the comprehensive agreement for trans pacific partnership now it's a multilateral trade agreement which uk has joined but us has already withdrawn 
The benefits to the UK are as follows. So 99% of the UK's export to these nations will now be under the zero tariff. Zero tariff means export promotion. 1.8 billion euros or 2.2 billion dollar additional will be made to the UK's economy annually. It will provide a gateway, economic gateway to the Indo-Pacific region for UK products and services. UK will also, as a member of this organization, can get veto on whether China should join the treaty or not because China has been trying to enter this treaty since 2021. And services which accounts for 43% of the exports to this organization, UK can leverage that. UK under the financial services, especially the banking services, has an upper hand in the international economy. So UK can export such services to these countries under this partnership. Now let's talk about the basics of this partnership from the prelims pointer perspective. Now this agreement is a comprehensive multilateral free trade agreement between 11 nations, Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore and Vietnam. On the map side, you can see these are the green shaded regions which are already the members. Some of the countries shaded in yellowish color or yellowish shade are not the members except the UK which has now become a member. So China is in the pipeline. So apart from the 11 and now the 12 that is UK are now part of this agreement. US has withdrawn in 2017 on the basis of certain issues. The issues were US was looking for longer copyright terms for its companies, automatic patent extension, especially for the pharmaceuticals, separate protection for the new technologies. So these are the three regions on which this agreement was not able to generate benefits for US. Hence, US under the presidentship of Donald Trump left this group. This group covers around 13% of the global economy and most of these provisions are similar to the original provisions where US was member. The features of this agreement includes the 95% of the tariff elimination among the traded goods, not services, development of production and the supply chains, which is an obvious reason for a trade agreement, creating more jobs, raising standard of living, improving welfare and promoting sustainable development especially for the Asian countries. It talks about the competitiveness and the business facilitation that should be provided by all the members. So if a company from UK is now entering into these member countries, they should be provided business facilitation. And this is one of the reasons why service sector from UK is going to benefit a lot. And here, this agreement talks about private participation in the government projects. Here, the role of PPP is very, very important. So beyond these basics, it is unlikely that this agreement would be asked because here India is not a major partner. With this discussion, please let us now move to the next article for the day. Now this article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 10 and talks about the higher cases of COVID-19 in India. The context says that as per the World Health Organization, Southeast Asian region has now reported over 27,000 cases in less than a month. And most of these cases belongs to the XBB.1.16 variant of COVID. Now you must have seen that in the last three years, COVID has gone through multiple mutations where number of different variants came out. Now this variant from the prelims perspective could be important. It's a sub variant and the recombination of existing two variants of Omicron. Now, Omicron was one of the deadliest variant of COVID-19. We all know that. This variant is highly transmissible with high infection rate as well. It can even escape the hybrid immunity or the community immunity, which was gained by the vaccination. Hence, it's a matter of concern for India as well. It has additional mutation habits, so it can mutate even in the future as well. But as of now, there is not a major concern because number of deaths have not been reported. The symptoms of this variant of COVID includes high-grade fever that even lasts for more than 48 hours, but it's a matter of concern. It's cough, sore throat, body pain, headache, cold, abdominal discomfort. The population which is at high risk of this variant includes a patient with comorbidities, elderly population, population with cardiac conditions, 
pulmonary issues such as asthma, tuberculosis, diabetic or even having chronic kidney disease. With this discussion placed, now we should move to the last discussion which is also most related to the prelims one. Now this article was published on page 5 and talks about that the US has now agreed to repatriate or send back 15 stolen Indian artifacts from India. These artifacts were illegally removed hence it was established. See, a country, no matter who that is, is not going to give back India its heritage until and unless it is proved illegally removed or it was removed without the permission of archaeological survey of India. So if permission was taken from India from the archaeological survey and that particular artifact lies in a particular country that is not going to be returned back. The 15 items includes two important one. First, the stone bust of Kamdev that is God of love according to the Hindu mythology which belongs to the 8th century. The second is Shwetambar and throne Jinnah with antidents of Yaksha and Yakshi belongs to the 11th century. Now this is the one which is given in the picture. So this is on the left side is the Yaksha and on the right side we have Yakshi. All these 15 items are going to be returned as per the Antiquities and Art Treasure Act 1972 which declares the following as an antiquity. Antiquity includes coin, sculptures, paintings, epigraph, object or anything which was detached from a building. Let's say somewhere down the line, let's say a pillar falls from the Sanchi Stupa or an image detached from the Khajurao temples. If that is stolen, taken back to the other country, can be written back. Any illustration or thing or an object belonging to science, art, craft, literature, religion, customs, moral, politics in the bygone ages. So let's say tomorrow somebody steals the Arthashastra of Kautilya that belongs to the politics, that belongs to the literature, should be written back and should be considered as antiquity. Now there are certain basic knowledge which you should have with respect to this important article. There are certain laws which guide the heritage and they are returning back. For example, if we talk about the Indian constitution, item 67 of the union list, item 12 of the state list and item 40 of the concurrent list talks about the country's heritage and their protection. Even in 1958, the ancient monuments and the archaeological sites remains act was enacted which was amended regularly. And then came in 1972 the Antiquities and the Art Treasure Act. This act talks about the regulation of the export trade in antiquities and art treasure. See, we never say that export cannot take place. There might be some display, exhibition. For example, Archaeological Survey of India might take certain artifacts from India for their exhibition in US. So the, how that will be provided from this act? It prevents the smuggling and the fraudulent dealing of the antiquities and lastly, it says that there should be a license to carry a particular artifact and this license is provided by Ar Archaeological Survey of India. Now the one thing important which was mentioned in the article is Yaksha and Yakshi. Who are they? They are actually the couple of male and female. Yaksha is a male and Yakshi is a female. But doesn't mean that they are husband and wife. It's a different representation of nature. According to the mythology in Jainism, Buddhism and Hinduism. All the three forms of religion shows the art of Yaksha and Yakshi. Who are they? They are believed to be the spirits, trees, mountains, rock, mounds, rivers, oceans, basically the natural forces. In Sanchi, one can find them. They are also available in Baisnagar. Didar Ganj Yakshi is a very very famous one. Just google down the image of Didar Ganj Yakshi which is also mentioned in one of the NCRT. That's all for today's daily news simplify. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for more such updates.